Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Intel Real Estate Investment Education Club. Today is June the 25th, 2021. And we have three excellent speakers for you today who are going to be talking about their apartment complex and the things that they needed to do in order to go from their acquisition, their purchase, all the way through to their first investor distribution. So what happens to a property once you actually take it over? What are the steps that you need to do to add value? What is the experience of this group here? And a full disclosure for this particular investment, I am a general partner on this investment, and uh, these are some of my partners. So they're coming in and sharing what they've done. They're the operators, meaning they're, they're in charge of uh, renovation uh, um, and um, you know property management and the day-to-day -day operations of the building. But first, let's go over, uh, not to show you my work screen here, but to show you the Intel Real Estate Investment Club SharePoint. I think that you all know about this by now. Um, if you don't know that we have upcoming meetings here, quite a few of them, as well as our previous speakers hall of fame. This is where Chris, Eli, and Nathan's pictures will go, highlighting all the different people that have spoken here in the past. And if you're interested in a particular topic, for instance, I know a lot of people have asked about Eng Tang, the, uh, the guy who started the real estate club at, at Apple and talking about qualified opportunity zones. Just go click on his picture, come down here. You can find his website, his email, the link to the video that he recorded. So if you wanna see that, just go over here and pop it into your browser. So all of that information is right at your fingertips. Um, I wish I could come up with a way of, of letting this information be external to Intel, uh, but uh, it's all here available internally. So make sure you take advantage of that. Some of the people that we have coming up in the near future, there's um, Dan Weisfield will be in in uh, about two weeks. Uh, of course, next week we have the day off as Intel, July 2nd, celebrating Independence Day, so there'll be no real estate club next week. Um, but following up after that, we have Dan Weisfield, who is one of the top 50 owners of mobile home parks in the United States. So we're going to get his take on it. And he's a, he's a little bit different than most of the mobile home park investors that I've seen in that his mobile home parks are on the West Coast. So Oregon, California, um, mainly. So that'll be interesting. We also have uh, Edward Gray down here. And let me look at my events because I think this this event page needs to be updated. Why well, I constantly have trouble with meetup.intel.com. I just updated all the events. There should be seven or eight of them here. But coming up soon, we also have uh, another person that I'm very familiar with. Her name is Keely Hubbard. She's going to be talking about how to invest in vineyards. So if you're interested <clears throat> in the wine country, if you're interested in uh, investments in wine land, come and listen to their talk. They specifically focus on Texas vineyards. And uh, we also have uh, Eng Tang coming back. We have uh, um, a couple that will be coming in to speak on how to buy and sell vacant land. Um, and that is coming up as well. So if you're interested in vacant land and how to flip it, that, that'll be coming up in, I think, three weeks. So with that, come check out the SharePoint. And let's see, are there any opens before we get going? Let me check to make sure that we we should probably have a decent number of people in the group by now, so we can probably get started. Okay. About to break 100. Are there any opens? Are there any topics that you would like to hear about before we get started? Uh, any questions? Any opening thoughts? Boy, silent group today. Glenn sent a message in the chat. Oh, there's a message in the chat. Yeah, for Eli, Nate, and, and uh, uh, Chris, um, I'll be glad to monitor the chat for you so you can concentrate on your presentation. And if there's a question that relates to the topic that you're talking about, I'll just gently interrupt. Um, or we can wait till the end and hold all the questions till then. Sounds good, man. Thanks. All right. Suggestion. IT allows SPO sites to be externally available now, so it might be worth a thought. Oh, OK. I'll follow up with you on that. If there's some way I can get the content that we have in this group external so that, it, um, you know, it's it's um, something that I can access, you know, externally, that would be great. I know a lot of people have asked for it. 
they just want to be able to put it on their their phone and play it like a podcast. All right, if there are no opens, I will turn the talk over to Eli, Nathan, and Chris. Guys, welcome to the hey, club here. Hey, Daniel. Introduce yourself. Yeah. I just want to say one thing. I see Eli's in his uniform. I just want to say uh, we appreciate your service. Thank you. Oh, man. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Eli, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell uh, tell people what you do and what your um, what your job is there. Sure thing. Uh, so, guys, nice to nice to meet you all. Thank you for having me on. Uh, that's a really cool platform, Daniel. Uh, I, I know a couple of speakers, so uh, that's gonna be really interesting to hear about um, uh, stuff like like Keeley's Vineyards and all that. So, but anyways, th th thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Eli. Obviously, my, my uniform kind of gives it away. I'm in the Air Force. Um, I work IT. Uh, I've been IT for about uh, 13, 14 years now, but I've been in the military for almost about 20, right? So I started out in the Army, Army Infantry, and then I spent about seven years doing that. I got out uh, for about two years, went to college, uh, joined the Air Force. I first my degree in business and uh, started investing in real estate uh, about 2014, 2015. We bought a couple houses. And uh, wanted to find a way to scale, like many other people. Um, want to scale, want to go bigger, you know, kind of figured out that, you know, it's more efficient to, you know, buy a business uh, look, like an apartment complex and, and scale that way. So anyways, you know, um, met up with, with Chris and Nate uh, probably about the end of 2019, 2020. And started kind of buying up properties throughout uh, Arkansas. And now we're partnering up to look over, you know, uh, markets in Arkansas, Oklahoma. And actually the one that we're going to talk about today is uh, one that we closed back during COVID uh, during 2020. So uh, I'm excited about it. And thanks for having me. All right. Are you trying to share right now? If if you have any problems, I'll make sure to pull up the presentation as well. So I am not. It, wh where's the share button? Or on the on the, on the you want to go ahead and pull it up. You can pull it up. Yeah, so do you see the big red leave button in the top right? It should be just to the left of that button, a little square. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a white square with the arrow pointing out next to the microphone symbol. Daniel, I think you're still sharing your own. Yeah, I think you're. Sh oh. I, I can't. Here we go. I stopped mine. <laughs> so you guys have been looking at my Gmail, so I guess I'm looking for Eli's presentation. <laughs> so Eli, I'm looking for your presentation too, in case in case there are trouble sharing. And it's the top top right hand corner. You said. Yeah, top right hand corner. There's a box with a up arrow. Uh, Control Shift E should get you there. Uh, Daniel, if you go ahead and spring it up, that'd probably be like the easiest way here that we're going to hold people up. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and start talking. I'm having a little trouble mm -hmm. finding it. You you sent it to me. Did you send it to me from your Evo2 Enterprise email? Let me see. Oh, actually, you know what? I think I found it. Let me see. Screen share. You all looking now? Not quite. It, it probably brought up. Okay, the there you go. Box. How about now? How about now? Can y'all see it? I think yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Great. All right, guys. Well, thanks for having me. Um, like Daniel said, we're gonna go ahead and talk about. It's kind of a case study, right? So these are slides that we actually um, presented to our our investor base back when we got this deal under contract. Um, but I'm going to go through just like the first uh, first 30 or so. I'm not going to go through like the entire thing because part of it is, you know, like the investing structure and all that, which you guys aren't, you know, which is closed now and it's not really, it doesn't pertain to this right now. But um, I did want to kind of share uh, like the deal itself, right, from acquisition um, through closing and kind of where we are now, right? So to kind of give you guys a overall picture of, uh, you know, how we found it, what the deal is and what we had projected. Um, our budget and then kind of how we're performing in modern day, right? Like in, in, in the current time. So anyways, um, this was a deal that uh, we had been kind of hunting down a lot of deal, um, a lot of deals in Arkansas. 
uh, part of the state where I'm from, right? So if you look at Arkansas, a map of Arkansas, if you look at the top right, top left hand corner, it's like the northwest corner. You go down about an hour or two. That's uh, Fort Smith where this deal was, and then you go two hours east. That's Little Rock, right? So that kind of forms a little triangle, and uh, that's kind of like the area that 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 we're looking in. You know, that that's the part where I grew up in. That's the part we know and I'm very familiar with. So when this deal came across our our lap, we liked it a lot, and uh, I kind of knew about it. Um, so just a disclaimer, like, like everything else, you know, we're not, uh, like consultants. This is all for education purposes. So if you guys need any kind of consulting, please consult your financial advisor. So this was our team, right? It was me, Chris and Nate. Uh, we had another partner, Mark Kenny. He's kind of our mentor. Um, he partners with us on, on, on various deals, um, throughout, uh, throughout anything that, that we're kind of looking at. Right. So he's kind of like the money man and our mentor. So just at a kind of a high level, uh, the deals, this was 145 units, you know, built throughout and built kind of three, three different stages around 77, the eighties and nineties, but it was, uh, two properties, uh, just about split in half, about a mile from each other. So it was a two, two property portfolio, right. Consisting total about 145 deals. It was stabilized, right. It's class, class C property and a really good part of town. Both of them are, um, one kind of cater to a a family demographic and the other one kind of caters to like a younger family demographic. So um, we, we like this property because it was, of course uh, it was in good shape, but the current owner, he, he had to sell. Right. So during COVID when everyone else was kind of pulling back, that kind of left a pool of buyers who were the ambitious ones, at least the ones who wanted to stay in the markets and keep, and keep, uh, keep looking and keep buying and then sellers who had to sell. Right. So they were kind of more motivated and this guy in particular, um, he had had the property for you know several years. Uh, he maintained it well; it was clean and good condition. The only problem is it was very dated, right? And so his kind of pro his kind of philosophy was, well, you know, I'm going to keep it in good shape. I'm going to keep rents very, very low, like way under market. I'm going to keep it in safe, safe conditions for mom and pa, right? So for them to kind of come in and and um, and uh, and live there. So there, there's actually, you know dozens and dozens of residents on these properties that had been there for like 10, 15 years. And so we knew that we kind of had the, had the opportunity to come in, um, you know, infuse some capital, do some upgrades to the interior, the exteriors and really push rents up. Right. So, uh, so our, our, our business plan was to, you know, kind of come in and not do anything too drastic. I mean, it was a pretty good condition, but we did have a little bit of maintenance, you know, like on the trim and wood repair, but we did want to kind of rebrand re it, uh, rename it, give it some new signage, uh, do interior rehab, bring the rents up. Probably like you guys have, have heard a bunch of times, this isn't like anything like, you know, super um, rocket science, you know, but we want to come in and and really uh, capitalize on those on those upgrades, right? Because he had he had had a, uh, a rehab package that wasn't consistent throughout the entire property. So when you walked in, you know, you had floors that were different colors, bathrooms that were different colors and different, different uh, schemes all over different lighting packages and all that. So we wanted to make it, you know, just one clean, consistent, modern look. Um, they had pretty like low water bills, um, but we really wanted to come in and, and hire a third party uh, company to implement a water conservation program for us. Right. So they're going to come in for around like forty thousand dollars, and they're going to replace all the toilets. Like they had, like I don't know who, what it was, but uh, about three three gallon three gallon tanks, you know. And so we're going to come in with about one point eight gallon tanks, do the uh, aerators and shower heads, and that would, and that would essentially cut our our water bills almost in half, right? So that was a huge huge cut off of our expenses. And uh, the Oh, yes, we have one question. Um, somebody is asking Daniel uh, Abby Shaw rather is asking about the projected 9.6% cash on cash return. And how does that equate to 100% total return in six years? Uh, we also have one other person who's requesting that you click on the hide button on the Microsoft Teams box at the bottom. I'll go ahead and answer that question, uh, Eli. Okay. I was, just, I was just actually typing the response in, in the box. I got to first. Okay. So, uh, okay, so Daniel, go ahead. Uh, Maybe you should introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah, I should. I should. Um, <laughs> Maybe I should even go on camera. Let's see here. 
background is here. There we go. Okay. I don't have a fancy background. So everyone, I'm Nathan Justice, partnering with uh, Eli and, and Chris. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so I won't go too much in the background here, but uh, basically to answer your question, the 9.6% average cash on cash is what we're projecting to distribute to you over the hold of the opportunity, right? And that's typically going to be a quarterly distribution once distributions start. The 100% comes from when we factor in the the sell of the of the property at the five or seven year uh, point um, when we when we have achieved the business plan, right? Typically, there's going to be a refinance. Um, out of uh, the capital stack that we're in. In this case, we're, we're uh, going to likely uh, refinance at uh, two and a half, three year mark uh, once we're fully stabilized. And at that point, we can return a percentage of the original capital. So how that works is you, you get, once we do that refinance, you get a percentage, it could be 30%, it could be 50%. Uh, obviously, the more capital we can return to you, the better. And then, and then we're doing the cash on cash distribution to you quarterly over the whole the five years, six years, seven years. Um, and then when we sell that property, those proceeds uh, go back to you on that sale, the profit on the sale. And that's how you get to that return. And let me jump in here right now, since uh, we've got over 140 people in the room. And I know some of you didn't hear that uh, initially we said that this is uh, not a not a uh, a request to sell or any sort of sales projections the this deal is already closed and we're actually just reporting on how the deal has done over the last year during covid so just so you know uh, even though it says investment highlights here this is this is not a offer of a sale yeah it's not i just want to kind of give give you guys a high level view of of how the project looked uh you know as we're as we're acquiring it, kind of like our projections and then how it's performing now, right? So it's kind of a case study. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pitch anything or anything like that, but uh, there will be a lot of you know tidbits of education in here. So hope you guys enjoy it. <clears throat> okay. So um, I was just kind of going through our business plan. You know, we had, you know, we we're going to focus on the interiors, uh, the exteriors, you know, so uh, it was in pretty good shape. So uh, we had planned to, um, repair a little bit and paint uh, a lot of like the metal metal uh, staircases and railings, you know? So like they were kind of like this this ugly brown, they were rusted in a couple of places. And so, and it went all over uh, both properties, right? And so we're like, okay, well, we'll come in. Um, we'll, we'll, since there's such a, such a, a big eyesore, if we could kind of paint those black, you know, like repair them and paint them black, they would really pop against the the bright exteriors already and uh, paint the doors. The, the doors were white and different colors. And so we paint the doors like this modern black, you know, to, to help a pop, you know, against against the um, exterior paint as well. So we have anything too, too daunting or too crazy to do to the property, but uh, it was like those small little increases that really, I think, helped us bring us the most um, most return. The owner also, you know, because his his current uh, business plan was was pretty simple. You know, he really didn't have too many too many forms of other income. So, uh, uh, oh, hello. Okay. Uh, I'll go through and have, try to mute that. Okay, awesome. He really didn't have too many forms of other income. You know, so uh, we like I think at the time he had like like two thousand dollars in other income annually. And we knew that we could kind of capitalize on just basic, you know, like basic uh, stuff like uh, uh, app fees, uh, uh, rent, rent, rent fees, and you know, bill backs and things like that, right? That could that could really help us uh, increase our revenue stream. So once again, you know, this was in Fort Smith, Arkansas. A lot of our investors back then they didn't really know what Arkansas, uh, you know, too much about Arkansas, about Fort Smith, but we liked the area, you know, right? So, um, and if you looked at it, if you kind of broke it down, you know, you could kind of see that there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, diversity and like different kind of mark uh, uh, and, and businesses and 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 job growth, and and it didn't have a gigantic population growth, but it did have a pre slow consistent growth throughout the last like 10 years for sure so we so we're kind of coming in looking at you know the growth in northwest arkansas the growth in little rock and and it was bleeding out to our sector too so we had we had um, a lot of manufacturing jobs right so which really helped out with uh time during covid so we had george pacific we had gerber peanuts we had ream train 
Um, there was a large education sector there. So we had like the, the University of Arkansas is also there. They have a little sister uh, college there. And Arkansas, um, oddly enough, is really big on health services uh, and, and manufacturing as well, too. Just these are just things um, that we're kind of that uh, we're kind of showing um, our team and, and the, the different factors that 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 drew us into like this market specifically. Right. So now uh, Fort Smith was also kind of a hub for Oklahoma and the rest of Arkansas. So any kind of trade or kind of business kind of funneled through Fort Smith. So the, there, there was a lot of activity going along uh, in that sector. Uh, so the city itself is kind of small, right? About 90,000 people, uh, just under that, right? It's, I think back then it was around, you know, like 88,000 or so. But altogether, like the MSA was pretty big, right? It's about 282,000 people. So and that included people from Oklahoma uh, and all throughout East and South Arkansas as well. It did have a pretty good um, uh, median rent. So where our current property was charging around, you know, four or 500 bucks in rent, you know, the average rent in the area for an upgraded unit was around 700, right? 600 bucks. So we're like, wow, you're way under market. And so we could really capitalize on that. Um, the meet home cost was, was, was pretty high and it also had a pretty low crime in the area, right? So if you looked at a crime index, you know, for the last like 10 years, you could see a steady, steady decrease um, in Fort Smith. And then, uh, and, you know, in 2020, it was like, I think, you know, under, I want to say under 480 or something like that, right? Which is pretty good for an MSA of like that size. So these are just kind of some of the the uh, different employers and things like that 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 uh, we wanted to show people. You know, so there's colleges, there's military there, a lot of manufacturing, uh, hospitals. So one second here, guys. If you've just joined the call, can you make sure that you go on mute? <laughs> so this is just a little more information on like the submarket itself. You know, it was in Sebastian County, um, one of the biggest ones in in Arkansas, and uh, it it did have like it did make the list of uh, on on uh, on someone's side at least <laughs> for one of the best places to live uh, was Sebastian County. Okay, so these are the actual properties themselves, right? So this one is called uh, Phoenix Village. And it was like uh, four buildings, kind of like an L that, you know, they had L's that back up and it's around 72 units or something like that. They're both about 70 units, right? Equal about 145. So this is like the top of one. And this was uh, La Casa, right? So we had to rebrand this one. Phoenix Village at the time had a pretty good reputation, you know, um, so we felt like we didn't have to rebrand that one. We, we did get some new signage for it. But La Casa, we felt like we had to rebrand it, kind of give it more of a modern feel to it. So uh, you can't see it in this picture, but there's some of these, like these old style looking stone apartments in the front of the, which I'll show you here in a little bit, but they're in the front of the, of the property. And so to capitalize on the, on our name that we gave it, we painted those, those stones gray. So we gave it kind of like, like this fresh, bright, modern feel, and we called it Graystone. But it was a mix. It was a mix of like on the, the, the top picture was the apartments. So it was a mix of apartments like in the top picture and the bottom picture was like these garden style units. Um, it was about uh, 12 of those. And then you had uh, three houses. One got demolished, but we, uh, uh, we kept two. So it was a pretty good mix of apartments throughout uh, Phoenix, apartments at Greystone, some townhomes and some houses all collected into one giant portfolio of 145 units. All right, well, this is a little map because uh, people like maps, I guess. And and so it's kind of showing you like where it is in, in Fort Smith. Uh, if you go a little bit of north northeast, that's where you're going to find um, Greystone. Yeah, so this, this is kind of like a little summary. Um, it was stabilized, right? So it had a 95% occupancy. And that, that's pretty important, too, because the kind of finance that we get is dependent on that, right? So you can get like the best terms. Uh, you don't have to have a fully occupied uh, property, but um, for us, the best terms that we get at the time pre-COVID, well, <laughs> at the beginning of COVID was um, anything above 90%. Yeah, so this is a couple more pictures to kind of give you an idea. So you see like all those middle railings, you know, um, 
the ones on the right hand side were already painted uh, but they weren't all like that color right so you kind of get like a good feel of uh, you know with like those doors painted uh, the railings painted a new parking lot that was you know sealed and striped just black too so it really it really popped you know against like this lower uh against like this lush vegetation very serene atmosphere uh very beautiful property it really it really draw, draws people in right so our our plan was to do some simple um yet very effective upgrades to the exteriors to draw people in and once they kind of got in they'd look at the interiors and see like a you know nice fresh interior rehabbed unit <clears throat> So, like I said, you know, here was a example of the interiors at, at Phoenix, right? Nothing too drastic. They didn't all look like this, but this was a good, a good portion of them at least, right? So they they were in good condition. They were just a little bit dated, right? So we can so we knew that we could kind of come in, do some floors, paint, uh, plot. <laughs> Hi, can we can we remind you if you're if you're on the call to go on mute, and I'll <laughs> and if somebody could help me find the the uh, people that aren't on mute, I could I could use some help scrolling up and down continuously. <laughs> it's difficult to uh, pinpoint the people. That's funny. Okay, yeah. So you know we could kind of come in and do some simple upgrades, right? We we had estimated about three point uh, about thirty five hundred dollars a unit. Uh, to, to do our upgrades right which was like you know countertops floors paint uh cabinets you know we'd paint put some new hardware if we had to replace doors you know we do the doors um, but most of them we, we don't have to um black appliances things like that very simple and here is graystone back then it was called la casa gardens now it's called graystone so it's kind of like the same idea right Some more interiors. See, see how it's kind of a mismatched uh, looking rehab. Uh, one of the things that that we really felt like, uh, so Greystone, it was pandering more to a family atmosphere, right? So uh, it had this giant, beautiful, lush uh, courtyard and nothing in it. So we asked the residents, you know, like what would they like the most, and um, they they said, hey, we want a a pergola and a kitchen and i think at the time we're thinking about doing a dog park we didn't we ended up not doing the dog park but we reallocated that money to something else i think we had reallocated it to dumpster enclosures which you wouldn't think are are important to people but um oddly enough they are <laughs> but um i'll show you some pictures here in a minute of of our of our gazebo and our our kitchen but this is kind of where we put it right here a little bit off to the left hand side but we're you know right smack dab in this in this big lush courtyard uh, this isn't it but this is kind of how it looked right this is actually very 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 close to how it looked it had the one on like the left hand side at least so there was a full gazebo not gazebo but a pergola and then we had uh, a kitchen with some grills we had some picnic tables and some chairs out there too Uh, one thing that we we did like about the about this property was the fact that the owner he didn't do too much to the interiors really over the last several years, but he did pour some money into like the exterior capex, right? So he was he was able to do uh, a good portion of stuff that really couldn't bring us extra rent, but was important maintenance wise, right? So he he fixed up a lot of like the wood rot, you know, he did uh, repairs to the AC as needed, uh, rooftops and things like that, uh, and. You know, because he really didn't care too much about uh, income, you know, he kept rents really low. Um, we didn't we didn't capitalize on the on the wash and dryer hookups. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to you don't have to take advantage of every single every single opportunity there. Uh, sometimes it's it's a good idea to kind of keep a couple of things open for the next buyer, right? To kind of put a little more meat in the bone. And so uh, we didn't use wash and dryer hookups, but they're still there. Once again, this is just kind of walking you guys through everything else that I just I just kind of explained. All right, yeah. So this is kind of explaining uh, right here. So currently they were around you know sixty seven cents a square foot, and uh, a lot of their comps in the area for um, upgraded units or just lot 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 ones were around like mid seventies and high seventies and eighties. Some properties even had a 
a dollar square foot, right? Uh, depending on on how nice and new they were. So we knew <laughs> coming in uh, that uh, that we could really, you know, force appreciation and do our upgrades, uh, turn around a whole new tenant base, lower our expenses, and uh, push rents to around. We have projected around uh, mid sev- mid to high seventies within five years, five or six years. All right. So that was kind of us through um, acquisition, right? That was how we picked it up, um, how we projected it, our our budget and our business plan uh, all, all the way through. We closed in September 2020, you know, uh, right throughout the height of COVID, a uh, very wild time, uh, but it was very prosperous for us for sure. And so if you guys wanted to kind of know like where we are now, this is where we are now um, based on our projections. So Pretty much uh, with income and uh, expenses, the, the the total income where we had projected it uh, around, uh, we are currently hitting around like between year two and year three, where we had projected year one to be, right? So, so I mean, I'm sorry, where we are in year one, uh, we're, we're hitting around years two or three income projections, right? So... As far as income goes, we are we are tracking, if not a little bit better. And then expenses, you know, um, coming in with a PM who kind of knew what they were doing. They knew the property. They knew the owner. So they knew all about it before we even closed, right? So they were able to give us a budget uh, well before we even put our, our, our LOI in or our letter of intent to purchase. And so uh, we're not we're not too shocked, um, but we are <laughs> pretty pleased with the fact that we are hitting our expenses um, what they should be, right? So total expenses, you know, right now we're uh, we had performed at around two hundred seventy-two thousand dollars, and we're hitting, you know, just just shy under that, right? So we're doing pretty good with that. Um, which you know, which makes for a pretty healthy NOI, right? So you have income, expenses, and the NOI, and uh, we're 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 shooting well above that, and you know, with our debt service and our fees, and then the cash flow. So, um, you know, I'm not saying we're, we're ready to sell quite yet. Right. <laughs> but we are, we are doing pretty well. And I would say a large portion of this is due, um, to two things, right? Like it's the market for sure. Right. This is a pretty good market. It's a good, good, like consistent cash flowing market. People are, um, definitely pouring a lot of investments into it, but also it's the fact that we underwrote so conservatively, right? Every you know, I would say most projections that we do in our performance are 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 so are so uh, so conservative that we're able to hit these um, these these projections and go above and beyond in a lot of cases. Hey Eli, we have a question from Mario. Yes, sir. And this yes, could sir. be either for you, you know, you or Nathan. But he's asking, how do you manage renovations with current tenants? How do you manage displacement? I'll take it, Eli. Um, Matt, go ahead. Good question, Mario. Uh, so there's a few things. So these are Class C um, apartments. Uh, what that means is sometimes they're desirable tenants, sometimes they're not desirable tenants. So part of taking over property is quickly identifying tenants that you want to uh, no longer be part of the property. So that can be a situation where they're not going to be renewed because they're consistently late. Uh, something like that right on on there or they violated the lease in which case they're moved from the city to the end of their lease or they're evicted from the property because they violated the lease in some way Um, in which case the unit becomes available for us to then go in and renovate Um, if it's a good tenant that we want to keep which there were several we had somewhere in this property for 10 14 years um, and and you know as long as they're okay with the increase in in the rents once we renovate we, we have moved some to the newly renovated units and then we can then renovate their unit and, and lease that out uh, later on once it's completed. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it, it, it such a becomes kind of a shell game, right? Where you're kind of moving people around, rehabbing new ones and kind of moving people to, to new units if, if they want to move. Sometimes we can't do that, right? So they just want to stay in, and, uh, in their current unit. One of the other things you can do is you can also, for incoming tenants, give them a choice of whether they want to go into a newly upgraded unit 
or, you know, or an older one. And, and that choice can be given to to people that are renewing their leases. So a lot of times people that are renewing their leases will choose to upgrade their living experience and then their older unit becomes available. Right on. Exactly. All right. So does is everyone good with the slide? All right. So here's what here was um, here was our plan. Right. So just to kind of give you guys some numbers, because I know a lot of you guys are engineers and you love numbers and spreadsheets. Uh, I do, too. Right. But uh, so we kind of. We had uh, projected out about thirty five hundred dollars, a little over that, you know, for the interiors. Right. So we had projected to do about 80 percent of the interiors, which was about, uh, you know, around one hundred and fifteen to one hundred twenty units. Right. So total about four hundred twenty six thousand uh, for the interior the interior renovations, you know, the same stuff that I had talked about before. Um, and then for the exteriors was kind of like the, uh, a pretty big bang too, you know, so we had like our wood repair, the, the, the uh, kitchen and pergola, exterior painting, not to paint the whole thing, but we wanted to paint the um, trim paint and, uh, you know, just different, uh, different panels that were old. It was like this old green uh, dated ugly green paint so we want to put like a gray modern uh, uh finish to it so we do like the exterior painting at uh graystone uh paint the metal railings at both at both areas uh, we wanted to do a new uh, parking lot seal and restripe so wherever they had potholes it wasn't horrible but they didn't have a couple of places where we had to repair it and then we're going to do a new seal and stripe make it pop make it look nice you know put some new new lines on there the laundry room, it wasn't in very good condition, right? So, oh, I'm sorry about that. No, the the old laundry room, we were we, we were going to convert to an office. Uh, that ended up changing, right? So we didn't, we kind of realized before we closed that we didn't have to renovate the old laundry room into a new office. We could just turn, um, we could maintain one of the other areas uh, for an office and then uh, use that money for something else. Uh, but the laundry room was the existing laundry room was uh, a little bit dated, right? So it didn't take too much, but we had to kind of come in, uh, fix up a couple machines, put some new paint. We had like a new mural. Fort Smith, oddly enough, is very artsy. <laughs> and so um, our tents really wanted some like a splash of color on the walls. And so we painted uh, an accent wall with a uh, with a little mural, a little modern artsy, artsy mural. And uh, Put some new furniture and some new stuff in there, like like folding tables and things like that. And then over at Phoenix, you know, we're going to do stuff like paint the doors, the metal railings, count the same thing over at Greystone, right? And uh, both both places, you know, we had allocated about ten thousand dollars for uh, new signage, and uh, both places we're going to do like the water saving plan. So total total renovations for the exteriors about two hundred forty thousand dollars. Hey, Eli and Nathan, um, when, when you first took over the property, what were some of the key projects that you wanted to start immediately that started adding value in the very first month? And and how did that change as you started to move into month two and three? So so I think the the biggest the biggest portion is that we wanted to do stuff that 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 really made the property pop. Right. So that because you want to show people that that there's a change in ownership, that we care, we're going to uh, make things nice again, right? So part of the money that we had reallocated actually went to fencing too, right? So um, some of the first things that we did was we wanted to uh, repair the, the wood trim and paint the trim and those panels. We wanted to um, paint and repair the stairwells and the balconies and also install fencing and signage. Right, those were like the simplest, but uh, most effective, uh, in in our opinion, effective tools for for um, to to draw in a good tenant base. Right. Plus that we had closed in the you know towards the end of 2020, and so we had to get that kind of stuff done before the new leasing season in the spring of this year. Right. So uh, those things kind of uh, were were kind of pushed all throughout the the winter um, to get everything ready for the spring of this year. And not much really changed. Um, we had to push out a couple of projects like the, you know, uh, maybe a little bit like the, the seal and stripe and things like that. But 
there wasn't there wasn't too much of a on this on this particular property, right? I'm not saying that like everyone's like this, but this one kind of flowed pretty well as far as like getting all these projects done. I, I'm going to ask another question here. How, how does the property manager figure into um, all of these projects that are going on? I'll take that one, Eli. Yeah, go ahead, bud. Yeah, so um, good question, really. Um, I would argue, um, honestly, given what we've been through with these properties, that your property manager can make or break the opportunity, right? Because when you're underwriting a deal, you're putting together this budget that you're seeing here. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, predicting going on, right? And of course, that's why you work with a property manager that has experience in that market and experience repositioning to kind of give you a reality check, right? So managing all this process, I mean, really has to do with the team that's on the ground, which is your property manager. Um, and then they typically manage the on-site staff, maintenance, all that. And then, you know, there's a a, a lot of back and forth um, on the, you know, we call it asset management, which is what Eli, Chris and I do. We manage the assets so that it actually achieves the business plan, which means we're communicating daily um, and have weekly calls with agendas to review, you know, what's the status of the business plan? What are we achieving as far as exterior rehab goes? And where are we at? Are we hitting our expectations on uh, the cost to do the interior turns, right? So there's there's another question on here from an unknown user about how do we keep the renovation so low uh, per, per unit of 3,500. So that was, you know, that was an initial estimation based on prices back then. They have, cost of materials have gone up a little bit. So at, we're having to tune the business plan in real time as we go through the unit counts and see if we can you know average out that cost because some units are going to need more work they'd be they could have more damage from tenants uh, and others could be more well maintained right so there's a constant rebalancing of budget um there right so but the original question daniel yeah the, the property manager makes a break um, and you have to be in constant communication and you have to push the property manager a little bit the property manager um, you know, wants to be successful and sometimes they don't necessarily want to push as hard as you need to as the, the sponsor running the deal, running the business, you're essentially running a business, right? Just trying to increase income, uh, reduce expenses. What do we have left after we pay the debt side? You know, can we can we pay the investors what we projected? Can we pay them more than what we projected, right? So those, the property manager is very, very critical. Great, Nate. Thank you, man. That was a Great explanation. Okay, and so these are these are the pictures, right? So these are like the the before and after pictures. So if you look at like the top row there, like those those three top ones, those are this is for Greystone, right? So you got like um, a typical unit, you know, back then, and this was but this was like those um, those little apartments in the middle there. That's the the old dated uh, rockstone <laughs> apartments. Right, and uh, that the bathroom on the you know that's a bathroom on the right hand side there, and so down the bottom is how it looks now, right? So you got this uh, on both sides, like this is only like one side, but on the if you if you keep going to the right hand side uh, and like the this left hand picture, you'll see another fence, a big long cedar fence that has a this big uh, which I'll show you here in a minute, but it has like, this beautiful you know uh, metallic sign on it, right? So. We wanted to be able to capitalize on the fact that we really couldn't demolish this building, right? Because it's that's, that's a lot of stones, a lot of money. So we wanted to, um, uh, you know, act, accentuate it, right? So we turned our weakness into a strength. So we painted it gray and called it gray stone, right? And then that's the interior unit now, right? That's before and after for gray stone. So here's like that 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 beautiful cedar fence and our new sign, right? right there and then the picture the dumpster enclosure so that's kind of some of that money that we had reallocated so uh, on the left hand side of uh, that picture you got the the dumpsters they're you know ugly standing out there in the open and so tenants like it whenever you put this little fence around there uh <laughs> oddly enough adds, adds a lot of value they uh they like it not in rent wise but they do appreciate it for sure well and it affects the you know the what people see when they first 
come to see the property, right? So as far as initial bang for your buck on adding value and changing the tone of the property is exterior improvements, right? So, you know, if you just, if you see a garbage can that that's overflowing, you're going to be like, oh, this place is poorly managed. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to go look somewhere else. So something as simple as that, right? Like garbage is, you know, so we had to, I mean, it sounds, it sounds rudimentary, but we had to increase the times, you know, a week that we have pickups done and that, and that's that little fix controls, right? Garbage overflow. <laughs> uh, and then, and then of course, like Eli just mentioned, you have this aesthetic improvement, which tenants appreciate as well as any new residents that may come to look right. And this is a class C. So, you know, that's a big deal to most class C tenants. Cause if they go to the competition, right, there's not a lot of competition um, in, in class C where they put these kind this kind of attention to detail. So it's really not rocket science. It's not difficult, um, right. To stand out. Um, if you've budgeted for it beforehand to be able to do little things like this, it may not seem like a big deal to people at Intel or myself where we would never live personally want to live in a place like this, even though, you know, we're improving the property, but to that tenant that's in that C class, um, apartment, you know, this, this does make a big deal. All right. And here's the, the pergola in the kitchen. So it tends to like, love this. We've had, a, we've had a couple, um, a couple of parties out there or appreciation days, you know, where tents can kind of come out. Um, well, it'll be sponsored, you know, with a, a cookout and some drinks and things like that. So uh, this is like in that the open courtyard uh, right next to uh, those garden style units. And then so, Phoenix. Oh, go ahead, bud. Oh, I was going to say we have a question from uh, Yong Mei, and she's asking, uh, what is the rent increase after renovation? So depending on uh, on the unit, I think on average they were hitting around before takeover, they were around like uh, uh, four. So just average, right Ac across all the properties, they were around like four fifty to four eighty um, a unit, and now we're hitting around uh, you know uh, upper fives um, to six hundred fifty a unit on average. So before they were around 67 cents a square foot, and now we're in like the the uh, the high 70s a square foot. All right. So once again at Phoenix, um, here is so this is uh, we didn't paint the total exterior. You know, we kind of kept it like that tan because we wanted to accent that. Right. So it was kind of a it was all like the same color. It had like white doors. It you know had a, a dirty exterior. There was trash everywhere, not everywhere, but they had trash and all that. So, like Nate had said, you know, we wanted to kind of come in and do some very simple but effective upgrades. You know, so we did some pressure washing, cleaned the trash, increased the dumpster pickups, uh, put the dumpster enclosures around there, um, did the stairwells. We repaired them, made them safer, painted them. Uh, sent them down, painted the the balconies as well. And so, and then do it like the uh, the door the doorways also. So we painted the doorways. Um, we also added some fire extinguishers as well. And then by doing that, we were able to kind of put this dark uh, stairwells and dark doors against like this very light exterior. So I think it kind of helped it pop in compilation with a you know a new parking lot. Very pleasing DI. Very pleasing. Hey, Eli, I'm going to answer a few questions real quick, if that's all right. Yeah, man, go ahead. Um, so I think you're also getting a general gist for, you know, value add, and you've heard it before from others, I'm sure. So it's nothing, no, nothing new. So I think some of these questions are actually really valuable too to see. So we're outperforming Performa, which is awesome. Um, but you also have to take that with a grain of salt because you, you don't know, you have to, you can't foresee potential um right potential other issues with the property that you may have to fix right from a capital expense perspective so even if we're outperforming we need to re-review budget see where we're at to make sure you know to maybe hold a little back so even if we could outperform and and daniel daniel uh was an investor in this deal we could send them you know more than what we perform at for cash on cash but maybe we'll hold back a little bit just in case 
Um, so with that, let me get to some of these questions. So there was a question from Rohan. He said, how do you spot a good syndication deal versus a bad one? Most syndications promise really good returns. And he gave some examples. So uh, to that, I would say, um, uh, I would you know talk to people you know who have, have worked with um, other syndicators um, because they're not all created equal. A lot of them will say, you know, everyone says we underwrite conservatively, right? But one of the things you can look at is if they're truly being conservative, they'll have an escalation on the cap rate. A lot of times they'll 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 reduce the cap. They'll say we're going to buy today at a five cap and we're going to sell at a three cap. But if they really wanted to be conservative, they would they would they would have the cap rate increase. And if the cap rate increases by the time they refi or sell, and it's still a good deal, that's a good indication that it is actually conservative. I can make any deal look good if I manipulate a cap rate, right? Now, with that said, people say, well, you don't know what cap rates are going to do, and they vary based on the MSA. Um, and with scares like COVID, right? And and you know, with 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 uh, you know, with the with the Fed's doing right now, right? They're needing to place money, and so are banks and institutions. So that's driving potentially bad investments happening right so the, the biggest challenge for eli and chris and i is to find a deal that's an actual deal without manipulating numbers to make it look good for an investor right we're not in it for acquisition fees we invest in all of our own deals as well um, and so identifying that is crucial so that, so one i would say you know phone a friend talk to daniel you know he's he has a lot of exposure to a variety of syndicators uh, and then he can also, you know, help with identifying, you know, whether or not it looks like a good deal. Uh, but, you know, of course, there's always that disclaimer, do your own due diligence. But you don't know what you don't know when you haven't really dived in before, right? There's a lot to the underwriting. <coughs> so I'll, I'll end there with that one. Uh, then we have hey, the just, total. Just a, a quick comment here. We've only got five minutes left and then we're going to be closing off the meeting. Hey, Eli, could you put your contact information up on the screen so that if people want to reach out to you, they can. And Nate, I'll let you continue with questions. That, should, that. I go ahead, should I go ahead and stop, stop sharing? Uh, can you can you just share your contact information up on the screen and we can just let it stay up there while, he, while uh, Nathan's answering questions. Okay, yeah. Can you all see what I got yep. going on here? Yeah, we can see yep. what you on there. So you can just edit one of those slides. Hey, uh, and then to answer uh, Anila, with COVID and many people wanting to own or rent homes, do you still feel now is still a good time to invest in multifamily? Absolutely. Um, there's a shortage in homes, one, uh, with 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 uh, inventory uh, being low. It, I mean, in every market, there's a shortage. Builders, there's there's a, a lack of supply, right, for building materials. So that's one thing. But also, we're again, I'll come back to the C class. In this case, C class, B class. So A class, I would I would maybe say you have a point there. But even A class, they're having to wait longer to even find a home. I mean, you try to you try to you try to buy a a, a pre-existing home. There's a bunch of offers on it. You try to buy a new home, the builders are constrained. Um, so A class, uh, I think there's still there's still potential there. I don't buy A class, but so B and C, um, they typically aren't can't afford, especially a C class tenant can't afford to buy a home, so they they need a place to live, and there's usually limited inventory. Uh, unless it's, uh, you know, depending on the market, they may be building 200, 300 unit apartment. But there's not that much. So there's always, you know, limited, limited inventory. So I would say, yes, it is a good, still a good time and always a good time to buy multifamily. Um, and then Jared said, do you foresee any issues with your business model given the potential changes to the 1031 rules? Uh, business model, I don't see an issue. I do see um, investors, uh, the business model will be fine. I think the investors, you know, obviously losing potential capital to to roll over is a concern. But we've actually in our deals, we haven't actually taken 1031 yet. Some some do take their 1031s. And if it's a much larger opportunity, like this was 145 unit, not a large purchase price. So the capital raise part wasn't as significant. Um, I, I'm concerned about 1031, right? Because when you when you go, if we were to go to sell this property as an example, uh, there's going to be a you know there's going to be a gain there that we we can or can't roll over. We have to pay those potentially pay those those gains right when we sell, right? So that's that's a bad thing. Uh, and then Mario again, do you seek out Class C properties specifically? What should investors focus on versus other classes? What are main trade-offs? 
Um, yeah, so higher the higher the class, you're typically looking for cash flow. Um, the lower the class, um, you also look for cash flow, but typically, you know, the lower the class, you're looking for that value add, which is a way that we can say, hey, we can actually, you know, we have we have one deal we're looking at now where we can return, we're, we're looking to return the original capital uh, up to 60% of the original capital in the second year. You can then redeploy that to another opportunity while you're maintaining your percentage of ownership and cash flow. Um, so yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot to go into there. Uh, I think you do great stuff. Good. Okay. So no more. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's for Mario. It really is a choice um, um, on, you know, what's more important to you, right? So we're also looking at properties with longer hold times as well, instead of like five, six year sell off, right? So who maybe want to own it for 10 years or 15 years and just keep that cash flow going. That's a different business model, but I'll stop there. You have Eli's contact information. That'll get you to Chris, Eli, or myself. Um, thanks again for your time. I'll, I'll shut up now. Yeah, All right. If you guys, if you guys have any more questions, please, please uh, text or email or call me and uh, we can, we can, I can answer any kind of questions you guys have. Hey, Nathan and Eli, thanks for being here and uh, presenting to the REI club at Intel. And uh, of course, next week we have a week off. There's no, uh, it's an official holiday for Intel, and, but we'll see you in two weeks where we're going to go over how to buy and sell vacant land for profit. So we hope to see you there and stay cool and have a, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Bye everybody.